Hi there, I'm Russell Klein and I'm going to be appearing on GBN Live this evening. We're going to be talking about leadership and I hope that you'll stay tuned and join us. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Hello and welcome to GBN Live. We're so glad that you're with us tonight. We are talking about leadership in the church. It's going to be a great subject. We hope you'll stay with us for the next hour. We have with us tonight Russell Klein. And Russell, so, so glad to have you with us. Oh, glad to be here. Also have with us Jared Jackson and very grateful to have Jared with us tonight. And Jared, good to, good to be with you. Likewise. As we begin our program tonight, I think that this is one of the more interesting topics that we have discussed in quite some time. It is a needed topic, particularly as we think about the role of the leadership in the church. I do want to invite those who are watching tonight to feel free to give us a call at 888-805-3390. You might want to email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org or you may watch us live on Facebook. You may share us on Facebook. We'd love to take your questions and comments tonight as we discuss the role of elders in the Lord's church. I guess as we begin tonight, is there a pattern for leadership in the Lord's church? Well, certainly there is. Uh, the New Testament does not leave us without any kind of guidance when it comes to organization within the body of Christ. Uh, the problem is that many people have, uh, I guess throughout history, have had their own ideas about how things should be organized and how the leadership should uh, conduct itself. And instead of following the New Testament pattern, they've gone their own way. And now it's very difficult for people to discern what is the New Testament pattern as opposed to what they have always been taught to be true. Sure, absolutely. As we explore this subject tonight, I know that there are roles and responsibilities inherent in the job. Jared, if you would maybe talk a little bit about some of those roles and responsibilities because the magnitude of this job, to me it's overwhelming in many respects. And so what about the roles and responsibilities of those who would function in this capacity? Well, uh, three things come to mind. Uh, first of all, some of the imagery that's used in the very name, one of the names being shepherd. And, uh, for example, uh, Paul's instruction to the elders at Ephesus, and he uses that language that they need to tend uh, the flock or to feed the flock. And so there's a certain level of responsibility. There's also, I think, the idea of a steward. Um, when you think about an overseer, one who's been placed to, uh, as in the role of a steward to oversee someone else's property, someone else's uh, possessions, uh, I think uh, that's a key term, that, that the eldership is a stewardship. And then finally, I think in part of the qualifications that are delineated by Paul, um, the idea of a leader, uh, especially in the context of a family, We're, we are leading in the family of God, and that, sure. that training and proving ground of the family is transferred then to the family of God. And so I think those are some, some key ideas that can be explored and developed, but um, really help us understand the role of church leadership. You know, obviously God in His great wisdom decided that every congregation is autonomous and that there are a plurality plurality of men who would function as overseers or elders in the church. Do you think that members of the church understand the gravity of the office of the eldership by and large? Well, I think that most members of the church probably don't appreciate how grave and a responsibility that it is. Um, I, you know, you're making a point there about the, uh, the fact that the Lord in His wisdom has not made it so that the church is ruled by the majority because many times the majority can be wrong. Uh, thou shalt not follow a multitude 
to do evil, as, as Moses uh, advised Israel. And, uh, and also, God in His wisdom has not made it so that local churches are just ruled by one man. That's right. You know, there's a plurality of elders, and in a way, they are, they, they are, they provide leadership, but ultimately, the leadership that they provide is in pointing everybody in the right direction, pointing everybody in the direction that God wants to go. That's right. Uh, the elders don't get to decide uh, how we're going to worship God, uh, what we're going to teach about salvation and about faithful Christian living. Their right. job, in a manner of speaking, is to see to it that God's will right. is done in that congregation. And that is a very serious responsibility. Well, absolutely. And, and I think their authority is in the realm of expedience. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. In, in the church today, I, I think that one of the things that is lacking across this country, uh, at least from my estimation, uh, there is a lack of preparation on the part of men, a lot of men, to serve as elders. And, and I know that there is some reluctance on the part of some folks to step up to the plate and serve as an elder. And maybe, maybe one of the reasons is because of the gravity of the job. Uh, the fact that Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says that they're watching uh, on behalf uh, I mean, they're watching over the souls of people, and they're going to give an account of that. But what could, what could local congregations do to inspire men to aspire to be an elder? And, and what about in terms of training or educating our younger men to, to step up one day and serve as leaders? Well, I think if you're, taking, if you're talking about in terms of the congregation, one of the greatest things a congregation can do is follow. They can follow church leadership. And uh, one of the great discouraging things that elders have to face are, are uh, members that um, are not willing to follow their leadership. Um, we can encourage them in a number of ways. We can make it an, a joy. One of the things that the Hebrews writer uh, says that we should not um, create sorrow for them. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't uh, do, they serve for our benefit. That's right. And so we, and, and many times uh, we talked a moment ago about the title of a book, they're losing sleep on our behalf. That's right. They're That's working right. to the point of exhaustion. So we should not do things that compound their problems. And I think that's probably one of the biggest deterrents. Uh, for somebody stepping to the role because they don't want to deal with the problems. Sure. Well, you know, in Hebrews 13, 17, he talks about that they may do it with joy mm -hmm. and not with grief, as you alluded to a moment ago. And so a lot of sleepless nights for men who function as elders, and uh, it, it is an awesome responsibility, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not a task that cannot be accomplished or fulfilled. Otherwise, God would have never deemed it appropriate to, That's true. to have leaders in the local yeah. church. At the Madisonville Church of Christ in, in Madisonville, Kentucky, where I've been preaching for the last 20 years, we've not had an eldership in all that time. And then just uh, last December, we appointed three men to, to the eldership. Prior to that, we had uh, three failed attempts to appoint elders. Either the men that were nominated didn't want to serve or something happened that just caused it to fall through. And uh, I think that for a long time, there were men who were very intimidated by the prospect of serving as elders and for that reason did not want to say, yes, I'll, I'll do that. And then also I think that uh, there were perhaps some in the congregation who figured, well, we've gone 20 years without an eldership. We're doing just fine. What do we need elders for? Mm -hmm. And you do have that danger. You have that concern that maybe some in the congregation in, in the men's business meeting would rather just see it continue to go that way instead of going with, uh, with God's plan. So. And what I kept emphasizing to my brethren is, you know, this is God's plan. We need to have elders because that's what God wants us to have. Right. And so I think maybe in some respects that, that got some people's minds to change. But if you're in a situation where you're part of a congregation that does not have a qualified eldership in place, well, the number one goal of that congregation needs to be to get a qualified eldership in place. Absolutely, absolutely. Got an emailed question. What if in 20 years you've never been in the elders' homes or 
they have never taught in a public manner. How would you respond to that? Well, uh, I'd first ask, have you ever invited yourselves into the elders' home? <laughs> I mean, it's always easy to point fingers sure. and uh, to not, uh, a question like that is so void of any context, so it's, it's hard to, to say. But certainly, an elder should be hospitable. That's one of the qu qualifications. They, sh they should uh, reach out and, and should be in members' homes as well. Yeah, I, I think about, you know, in First Timothy chapter 3, he talks about giving to hospitality. And as one fellow said on one occasion, that means he's a people person. And, and so from my vantage point, I'm not so much as concerned about whether or not he has members in his home mm -hmm. as is he in their home. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think, you know, however he wants to go about knowing the flock, I think that's mm -hmm. his prerogative. Uh, the main thing is person to, is somebody who's not closed <clears throat> off, somebody that is receptive and you can talk to them. And that, that, I really think that that's what the spirit of that qualification is all about. Yeah, and w l let me just ask this very quickly. We, we talk about giving to hospitality. And I think that the demeanor of an elder ought to be such that he is approachable. Mm -hmm. In, in other words, he has a spirit where it's an inviting spirit that you know what you can go and, and talk yeah. to him, and and you don't feel mm -hmm. like you're being browbeaten or or yeah. anything you know. But there's this sense of you know what he he is here for me and mm -hmm. he has my interest at heart, and he's concerned about my spiritual welfare, and so I can go and literally bear my soul. Mm -hmm. And I've known some elderships <laughs> that were seemingly unapproachable you know, seemingly too busy to deal with the petty problems of the members of the church. Sure. And, you know, that never ends well. That, that always <laughs> ends up uh, creating a, a big problem. So, you know, you, an elder doesn't necessarily have to be an extrovert, but an elder does have to be someone that is approachable, as you said, and that people can feel like they can come to them and talk to them about anything. Absolutely. And they're not going to be browbeaten. They're not going to be made to feel that they're unimportant, but right. they're going to be heard, and uh, the elders are going to genuinely care about them. Absolutely. When we talk about the role of an elder, their role is more spiritual in nature. Do you think sometimes that some elders are reluctant to wade out into that spiritual realm because they're more comfortable in the physical <laughs> realm? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's always easier to deal with a leaky roof than it is leaky brethren, gossiping <laughs> brethren. Or, and, you know, the, the reality is confronting a person about their spiritual condition is difficult. It is tough. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what the job is. It's not uh, administrators, although that may uh, be part of it. The primary job is to handle the flock. Mm -hmm. uh, and not the corral. Well, you know, in, in Titus chapter 1, Paul talks about holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict, which mm -hmm. I think suggests that someone who functions as an elder, a shepherd in the Lord's church, has to be willing to be somewhat confrontational when it comes to spiritual problems. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. he goes on to say in verse 13, rebuke them sharply. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I think that it's done in the right way, but, and, mm -hmm. and you know, none of us, I, I don't know of anybody that, well, maybe I need to back up. There are some folks that like confrontation, <laughs> but you know, m most of us would rather not be confrontational, mm -hmm. but, but it comes with the territory. Yeah. And, and so, how do we encourage men who, you know, they're good men, they're godly men, they're knowledgeable men, and sometimes they're reluctant to roll up their sleeves and get involved in the lives of people because of it's, you know, maybe it's a sticky situation. So how do we encourage them and let them know, look, we're here for you as members to support you and, and, and do our best to hold up your hands? Well, that is such a very important thing. The eldership needs to know that the brethren are behind them and that the brethren are backing whatever it is that they're doing. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's necessary for elders to take the lead, say, in, in church discipline, uh, in uh, withdrawing fellowship from a member of the church that uh, will not repent of their sins. 
and uh, that that can be that that can be a, a nerve-wracking thing for anybody. And to know that that the people of the congregation are behind you, they are supporting you, that can then enable you to do those things that you may not want to do, that you might see as being very unpleasant. But uh, you know, if it was if it was easy, then everybody would do it. You know, but yeah. it's it's not easy, and that's why elders are a very special breed of men. Yeah, you know, I know that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jared. Well, I was just going to say that. Also, I think um, in their, the ability to handle these kinds of situations comes with practice mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you'll have an, an entirely new eldership that has not um, uh, had a lot of experience and they may make mistakes. They may uh, bump <laughs> along a little bit. In other cases, you can have a new elder come into a congregation that has had an eldership for 50 years. And so he can learn from older, uh, more experienced elders. There's, there is a learning process that goes on with an eldership as it is with any other human activity. There, there is a learning process. There, oh, yeah. there is a steep learning curve, I think, once you get into and And that's not to say that uh, uh, one of the qualifications, obviously, is they're knowledgeable in the Word. They're not a novice. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, again, going back to the gravity of the workload, Oh, yeah. and, and what yeah. all's involved. I mean, there are things, and you have to learn people, and you have mm -hmm. to learn how to deal mm -hmm. with people. And, and I, think that, I think that as members, as brethren, we need to be patient and encouraging. We need to be prayerful for them and let them know we're pr that we are praying for them. I, I know that, and I've heard this from elders before, that sadly they get more complaints and criticism than compliments or, or people saying, you know, we appreciate you. And, you know, maybe there, maybe there are times when criticism is justifiable in the lives of all of us. But, but I look back at Moses, and, and Moses was the, the leader and lawgiver of ancient Israel. And time and again, he had to deal with people that were murmuring and complaining. And, and, and you know, after a while, that gets old. Mm -hmm. so, so, how do you maintain patience with, with, with the flock? Oh, that, that's a very difficult uh, question. That's true. You know, I mentioned earlier that we did just recently appoint three brand new elders at Madisonville. Uh, all three of them have never been elders before. And uh, fortunately, though, we have three other men in the congregation, older men who have been elders in the past, and they can go to them for wisdom, for encouragement, for all those things that they need, but uh, yeah, it's it's a tough thing, and even preachers have to put up sometimes with more criticism than than compliments. But well, you uh, know, Paul in Ephesians chapter four talks about how those of us who are members of the body of Christ, we need to demonstrate a, a sense of long sufferingness. Mm -hmm. We need to be forbearing or bear with one another, and of course, the goal is to maintain unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think part of it is picking the right individual for it to be an elder. You know, one of the qualifications is that he's not soon angry. Mm -hmm. And so you can go and observe someone um, on, as a coach in Little League or in the family or on the work environment. You can see over time, how does this person respond to pressure? Mm -hmm. um, what is it that, that uh, sets them off and how do they handle it when they are angry? Because every one of us get angry, sure. but how do we deal with it? So part of it is just, you know, it's part of the selection process is handling the right person uh, uh, to be an elder and to, and to exhibit the qualities that, that demonstrate and will, will um, show itself in good leadership. You bring up a great point. We've got a Facebook question. I want to get to it in just one moment. But you mentioned the qualifications, not soon angry. Do you think sometimes we, we tend to focus on one or two qualifications to the exclusion of others. In other words, n number one, is he a married man? Number two, does he have believing children? And, and those two qualifications seem, at least from my perch sometimes, just looking back over, over the years, those seem to be the two overriding characteristics that brethren look for. And, and some of the other qualifications uh, not soon angry, uh, uh, not greedy mm. for money, et cetera. 
th those are things that maybe n don't get as much attention. So, so how do we how do we balance that? Well, I think it it has to be through the instruction that comes in the local congregation when when elders are going to be appointed, and I'm sure they did this at Madisonville. You spend a lot of time teaching all the qualifications, mm, sure. and we look at ways at how to examine these. These men are to be examined to see whether or not they have these uh, qualifications, and so. I think a lot of instruction, not just lightweight, we need to dig down into the words, mm -hmm. into the grammar, into the, the uh, instruction that, and sometimes there's reasons given for a particular qualification. We need to dig down and go below the surface. Okay, you just triggered another thought. And, and so <laughs> let me just kind of piggyback that, but one, one of the responsibilities of an eldership is to feed the flock of God, mm -hmm. Acts 20, verse 28. And so, do you think that in the teaching process, whether from the pulpit or the classroom, do, do you think that, that maybe emphasis needs to be given in the local congregation to, to teaching these qualifications and characteristics you know, on somewhat of a regular basis? Oh, absolutely, especially if you're in a congregation <laughs> that doesn't have an eldership. The qualifications for the office of elder needs to be something that you discuss on a regular basis. You know, I've, I remember when I was a student in preaching school, they would tell us there are certain subjects that you just need to address regularly because they are fundamental, they are essential, and brethren will forget them if you don't keep reminding them. And, uh, and that's one of them. And then even after you have elders, if you, you've, you've got to keep that out in front of people's minds because, you know, your elders won't live forever. Somebody's going to have to replace them in the coming years. And uh, it's important for that next generation to understand what the qualifications are and, and to understand that it's possible for a man to deliberately prepare himself to be an elder. You know, some people, I think, al almost have the idea that, oh, if somebody wants to be an elder, well, then maybe they shouldn't be because they want it too much. Well, y you have to teach them to want to do it. And uh, if they don't want to do it, then they're not going to serve. Well, I, I mentioned Moses a moment ago. Go back to the Old Testament. Moses, well, Joshua served under Moses as somewhat of an attendant. And think of the... Think of the things that he learned under the tutelage of, of Moses. And, and then I think about in Joshua chapter 1 when God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's time, you know, arise. And, and of course, he had the responsibility of leading the children mm -hmm. of Israel into the promised land. But he had prepared himself well. And as a result of that, when, when Moses died, he was able to step into some pretty mm -hmm. big shoes and carry on. I don't, in addition to Russell's thoughts, I'd also um, point out that uh, instruction needs to happen not only in a crisis. In other words, there's a lot of times that when we do have a crisis and, and we, we go to the Bible and we'll get some instruction, but um, a lot of times in a crisis, it's when it's least receptive as well. And so a lot of times we can more effectively cultivate the soil so to speak, when there's not a crisis. So I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Good point. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Hope you'll stay with us. Hi, I'm Don Blackwell, and I'm here today with Lance Mosier. Lance is the author of the book Transformed, A Spiritual Journey. In this book, Lance basically tells the story of how he became associated with the Lord's Church. He gives some background to some denominations that he was associated with, and, and he explains his journey. Lance, tell us what prompted you to write this book. I learned the truth, and I wanted everybody in my life to learn the truth as well, starting with my family. So I sat down one day to write a letter to my family explaining what I had learned, but then I realized friends and other associates in my life needed to learn it too. Everybody in the world needs to know the truth. So I changed it to a book format, a story format that people can follow and learn everything that they need to learn, what I had learned and obeyed. Okay. It is an excellent book. I have read it from cover to cover. It contains everything that a person needs to know to become a Christian, complete with book, chapter, and verse. 
it's a great evangelistic tool. If you're studying with someone, I'd recommend you get a copy of this book and give it to them and let them read and it will help them in their process. Lance, tell us how people can get a copy of the book. You can head over to the book's website, transformedjourney.com, but that will send you to the World Video Bible School website, which is wvbs.org. And you can order one copy at a time or different size cases as well to hand out for evangelistic purposes. Okay, thank you, Lance. No problem. All right. Lord, I commit my life. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comment section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Thank you for staying with us. We are back tonight to discuss leadership in the church, and this is a very important topic. I'll take a Facebook question now. It seems that many church members look at the eldership primarily as who you go to to complain about whatever problem you have in the church, especially if it is a problem with them, the preacher, etc. Could you address this problem and suggest solutions for it? So, how would you respond, guys? I remember. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Brother uh, Jim Fawn came to our congregation and talked about the qualifications for the office of elder. And he talked about how that, that he was once a preacher, then he retired and became an elder. And he said, when I was a preacher, people would come to me with things and I would say, well, you got to go talk to the elders about that. Now that I'm an elder, people come to me with things and I say, well, I'm only one man. Yeah. So uh, I guess in a sense, uh, uh, it, it is, it, it, can, it can get exhausting. It can wear you down a little bit just hearing complaint after complaint. But that is why the Lord made it so that you are not all alone in the eldership. You have one or two or however many other elders that you can talk to about this and, and you make, it, make your decisions together. Do, so it doesn't have to be so overwhelming. Yeah, do you think that when, when people approach an elder, with a problem or problems. Is it wise for an individual elder to listen to that complaint and, and try to address it? Or would it be better to say, you know what, let me set up a meeting with the eldership mm -hmm. and let us meet and, and discuss it? How, how do you feel about that? Well, mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it, it's one of those it depends questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to be uh, approachable as an elder but I think most importantly, the eldership needs to have a unified front. And in many times, it is something that uh, you can listen to people. You can try to ask questions and understand what exactly the problem is. But I think there's a matter of training the flock as well. And uh, let them understand that uh, I understand your question. I understand your complaint. I understand your concerns. I will address this with the other elders. And then the eldership can address it in a unified uh, approach. I think you do get into trouble when you have um, elders that do a little freelancing, so to speak, and maybe get ahead of the eldership itself. But every situation is different, and there may be something that he can address very quickly um, with the full confidence that he, his eldership is with him. Yeah, the, the elders that we have at Madisonville decided very early on that since there were only three of them, that they wouldn't make a decision unless all three of them agreed on what to do. And in, an, in that way, they've been functioning in a very unified manner. And I can see where, you know, if you had five or six elders, you might want to put things to a vote. But, uh, you know, when you've got just two or three, it, it is good to be able to have agreement and everybody be on the same page so that you don't have, you know, one elder making a decision and then the other elders being surprised by, by the, the decision that was made. Well, you know, I remember years ago, Brother Gus Nichols said, with regard to the eldership, every man can have his say, but not every man has his way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And, you know, sometimes elders disagree in with regard to expedience. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but collectively, they, they have a unified front in the sense that if, if you know, you got a 3-2 decision made, mm -hmm. then the two that, that maybe 
we're looking at going a different direction, you know, they say, you know what, the eldership has spoken as a whole, and so we're going to be unified in that respect. Oh, yeah. And even the one that, that was in the minority in that situation has to respect the authority of the That's eldership. Right. Um, I think it was also Jim Fawn who said when he visited us in Madisonville, an elder doesn't really have any authority at all, but the eldership has the authority. And, you know, it's the idea of, well, it's like the idea of not having a head elder, you know, not having a, a one man that sort of overrules everybody else. It's supposed to be all of the elders together making decisions. What does it mean to have children who believe in Titus 1-6? Uh, that's uh, uh, probably one of the more controversial uh, qualifications of an elder. Um, the King James Version says faithful children. The ASV or American Standard Version says children who believe. And the, and the, um, the two major views are that um, it simply can have reference to any child of any age that is respectful to his parents. On the other hand, there's the point of view that it has reference to children that have uh, become Christians. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the greater weight is leaning towards the latter, mm -hmm. especially when you look in the context where it is set against riotous and unruly or disorderly living. Mm -hmm. So it certainly would not have reference to uh, young children. They may be uh, unruly in terms of disobedience, but when we look at those words and how they're used in the overall context of the New Testament, it's debauchery. It is uh, sinful living. And so obviously this is, I think it's obvious anyway, that it has reference to children that have been reared in a Christian home that have come to maturity and have uh, been led to Christ by their spiritual leader. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good point. Great point. Mm -hmm. Another question. If a man meets the requirements of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and his oldest child is recently baptized, a young teenager. Is that man eligible to be an elder, or does his child need to be faithful outside of his father's home? I don't know that there's really a, a, a need for a long track record of faithfulness uh, when it comes to an elder's children. I, I would, however, I, I mean, I, I'm, you all may disagree with me about this, but I do uh, have a, a little bit of trepidation about putting a man in the eldership who still has young children that haven't been baptized yet. Mm -hmm. Because what do you do if while he's an elder, one of his children grows up, becomes an adult, and is never a Christian? Mm -hmm. You know, then you might have a bit of a crisis there. I think it's better to wait until all of that man's children have been baptized and then consider him for the eldership just as a matter of, of expediency. I, I do think that sometimes we in the church uh, put men in the eldership who probably are too young to be there. And while the New Testament does not specify an age, the term elder it itself implies an older man. Implies an older man. And uh, I think there's some merit, some wisdom in that. If you're looking in your congregation for who's going to be an elder, look to the older men before you start thinking about the, the younger men. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let, let me ask this question. What, what, about, uh, what about a man who has two believing children and one who is an unbeliever? Would, would that man be qualified? Well, I think there's a technical answer and a practical answer. Um, the text says, having believing children. And uh, furthermore, in 1 Timothy, uh, the emphasis there is uh, that they have been in his household, in his own house, that he has been, uh, they have been under or in submission to him, that they have been obedient to him. And so it gives us a, an overall picture. And I think we, what we have to do is step back and look at what's going on here. We have a pattern that is being established in the home. Sure. There's a pattern of character in a, a spiritual leader that is being uh, both tested and proven uh, and training. Training is going on. I'm being trained as a father for higher spiritual service. It's amazing that God has, has the way He's designed the human family. The human family was designed 
for our spiritual enlightenment to, to help us go to heaven. Yeah. And so when, when I am a father and I'm teaching my children about God, I'm living by example, I'm giving them instruction, I'm giving them correction, I'm being gentle but firm, I'm a firm but loving parent, I'm being trained for higher spiritual service. Mm -hmm. And then it's also a proving ground because not everybody's a good parent. Mm -hmm. Just biological mm -hmm. uh, procreation does not a parent make. Yeah. And so I have to be proven that I have the, these qualities to be an elder. And so um, when you start getting into getting, deviating from the pattern, you, it may be looking for loopholes. We need to remind ourselves that Paul also said, lay, no, lay hands on no man quickly. In the context of an eldership, you don't just, as soon as he's got his three kids baptized, let's yeah. stamp him as an elder. Mm -hmm. No, you slow down. You know, we're looking at eternal yeah. Well, you know, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul talks about one of the qualifications for a deacon, he said, let a man first be proved. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a, a sense in, in which a man proves that he is a capable leader mm -hmm. in the home, which obviously would help to qualify him to be a leader in the church. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, sure. sure. Uh, another question that has come in, and matter of fact, this one really, I, I guess, goes back to the the previous question a moment ago comes by way of Facebook. Do the children have to still be faithful when they live out of the home? In other words, when they uh, leave mom and dad. Yeah, that's always been a big uh, controversy as well. Uh, if you've got a man who has uh, uh, two adult children, one of them a faithful Christian, the other one was baptized but is now no longer faithful, uh, is that man still qualified? And uh, as, far as, the, uh, as far as that goes, the, the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 uh, specify that, that the elder is to rule his own house well. Wow. And uh, when, when a child leaves mother and father and cleaves to his wife, he's an adult now, he's got his own family, he's the head of his own house, is he still under the influence of his parents? He is to a degree but not like he was when he was living under their roof. Mm -hmm. I think the strong argument can be made to uh, make the case that, that when an elder has children that are living at home, they must be obedient to him, sure. they must be faithful. <clears throat> when they're out on their own, you can't fault the parents if the child goes astray because the child ultimately is going to go off and make his own decisions and his own way in the world, and sure. he, might, he might end up falling away as a result of that. Let, let me ask this question, guys, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think contextually what, what you're talking about, he's talking about someone who rules his own house well. When your children leave home, they're no longer under your authority. Mm -hmm. But I've had others come back and say, well, you really don't know what kind of job you've done until they leave home. So, so how do you rebut that argument? Well, I think the first thing you do is you have to look at the text. And um, we can come up with a lot of different scenarios um, or hypothetical situations. But when you, when you look at the text itself, it's very clear that he's talking about um, what is proven in the home. You can have a situation, and I've heard individuals mm -hmm. say, well, here's the situation. There's a man, um, he's a faithful Christian, uh, loving husband, and he has two adult uh, uh, children that are Christians. He's qualified, right? Well, not necessarily. It could be the fact that, that they were uh, not um, Christians. They were, all were not Christians when they were uh, in the family. His adult children maybe became Christians later and taught him the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the fact of the, the matter is, is he has never gone through the proving process of leading, spiritually leading a family to Christ. And so he would not be qualified under that just because we can fill out a, a checkbox uh, yeah, I agree. Have I adult agree. children. Great thoughts. Great thoughts, guys. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hope you'll stay with us. 
put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. GBN Live is brought to you by Churches of Christ. If you have any thoughts or concerns about tonight's content, please write to us at 8900 Germantown Road, Olive Branch, Mississippi, 38654. Our email address is gbnlive at gbntv.org. Feel free also to call us at 888-805-3390. To view past episodes of GBN Live, visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash GBN TV. Just search for Gospel Broadcasting Network and don't forget to click subscribe for updates on new episodes and to see when GBN goes live. GBN is also available on Roku, Apple TV, iPhone, iPad, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. To find out more, visit gbntv.org. Thank you for staying with us. We are continuing our study of leadership in the church. Got an emailed question. When the elders begin to teach and practice unscriptural things, what is the best thing to do after confronting them? If we teach, it might split the church and show disrespect to the eldership, or do we just move to another congregation and allow the problem to continue? Uh, interesting question, thought-provoking. Indeed it is. That's a question that I can remember hearing many times uh, back in the 80s and 90s when there were so many problems with liberalism in the church, not that there aren't any now, but it just seemed like a lot of congregations were being taken over by that and brethren were wondering, how long do we stay? You know, how many chances do we give this congregation to turn itself around before we have to leave and, and go somewhere else. And really, it, it's hard to answer a question like that and say, well, this many times and, and no more. You do have to talk, be willing and able to talk to an eldership. If they've made a decision that's unscriptural, you have to be able to show them in the Bible where it is unscriptural and reason with them. And if they will not listen to reason, then you may have to pull up stakes and go somewhere else, which is hard because in a lot of places there's nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah. So that can be yeah. a very difficult thing. Well, for example, I, I know of a congregation in, in the Nashville area, a uh, uh, lot of history with this congregation in terms of they've been around a long, long time, uh, a large congregation, and they made, the, they made the decision a couple of years ago, the eldership made the decision to bring the instrument into one of their worship services. And in an effort to, I guess, quell the fears of some of the people, the preacher presented two or three lessons outlining their reasoning for bringing the instrument in. And, and I guess the thing that really struck me when he began uh, his reasoning process, he said, you need to understand right up front that no one has preached on this subject here from the pulpit in the last 30 years. <laughs> and, and then he went on to say, you know, that they didn't believe it was a salvation matter. But I do know, for example, of one family that as a result of that made the decision to leave. And so where do you draw the line and say, okay, you know what, you know, I've done my best, I've tried, but, but they're moving in a direction, it's obvious they're not coming back, and so I, I've got to leave. 
Well, I, I just think that a lot of times when a congregation is going in those directions, I think people tend to stay too long, actually. Mm -hmm. um, when you, it gets to the point where it's open in the uh, pulpit and the elders are advocating it, the reality is we like to think that we'd be able to have some persuasion uh, with them, but it's usually too late at that point. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, we, we just need to make a decision what's best for our families. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another question, how much, how much authority does the eldership have in my life? They feel that I am an important part of the congregation and shouldn't take a job out of town. Am I sinning if I leave? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. I'm not sure I fully follow the thought process there. but Well, I mean, I can understand an eldership saying to somebody, boy, we really wouldn't want you to leave. I mean, uh, we, I've said that to people at times in Madisonville, you know, who were thinking about taking a job somewhere else. And I say, well, boy, we really hate to leave you, but if you have to go, we, we wish go. you well. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that anybody would think that it would be a sin for yeah. someone to to, to, Make leave. The decision to leave, you know, sometimes you just have to for economic reasons to take care of your family or or something like that. And uh, I wouldn't imagine anybody begrudging somebody something like that. Although, I mean, I have to say that that I wouldn't say it's impossible for somebody to feel yeah. that way. Yeah. But yeah. it just seems extremely unlikely that that that's how an elder would actually feel that sure. someone is sinning by by moving away. Sure. We got a caller that actually left a message. We have an eldership that will not uphold Matthew 19:9 and other passages dealing with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. What can be done in this situation? Which is a viable question. So, how how, how would you answer that, Jared? Well, it's probably one of the most common problems that create uh, church confrontations these days, and there are so many elderships that just will not teach. Uh, accurately on Matthew 19.9. And uh, I'm sad to say that frequently it's because of problems within their own family or with, it, with relatives. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many have restudied the issue and it, it, it's also amazing how many times after restudying it uh, the, the Bible now conforms to their family situation. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's again with any of these problems, if you're if you're working and worshiping at a congregation that you can't feel sound mm -hmm. working and worshiping, you should find somewhere else to go mm -hmm. or <laughs> worship in your home or whatever the situation is. Sure. Which raises the question, and, and sadly, there have been really good congregations that the, the, the brethren that, that helped establish the work and, and really lay such a great foundation and poured their heart, soul, their pocketbook into the work. And then to see that congregation move in a direction that is not biblical. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's almost as if we, we, we walk away and give unsound brethren, mm -hmm. we, we, we give them everything that they want. So, so how do you balance that? <clears throat> well, I think you, uh, you have to Again, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, one of those it depends questions. You know, if you have a large segment of the congregation that is uh, not in agreement with the elders, uh, you know, one of the qualifications of the elder is that he is not self-willed, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times, uh, again, the selection of the man really, really uh, has a critical role at at some point. That, I think that's probably one of the most uh, neglected qualifications because mm -hmm. when there's a confrontation, whether it's scriptural, whether it's judgmental or whatever, the not self-will qualification is the one that really comes into play. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. Yeah, you know, one of the, I guess, foundational characteristics is a man has to be grounded in Scripture mm -hmm. and, and, and willing to take a thus saith the Lord approach. And so maybe one of the reasons why some congregations have been lost is because the men that have been selected to function as elders haven't been grounded in truth as mm -hmm. they should have been. 
And so mm. as a result, they get in and then they begin to move. And you, you mentioned something, Jared, a moment ago about how guys are elderships, preachers, et cetera, are sitting down and re-looking at scriptures and coming to different conclusions. And I, I think it was Hugh Fulford who said, you know, it'd be refreshing to see somebody study a subject again and say, you know what, that's exactly what we believe. <laughs> you know, you know? And I think he's right. You know, I mean, how many times do you hear somebody go back and re-study and say, you know what, mm -hmm. what I believe is right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Or what I believe is wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to change. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I got another Facebook question. Is it wrong to try to convince a man to desire the position of elder when he meets all of the other qualifications? I don't, I think it, it, it's, um, I, I have never known a person who's been told, well, the, the congregation has selected you to be an elder that he wasn't shell-shocked mm -hmm. or in a deep state of reverence. And sometimes there may be some great grave hesitation because we, a good elder will reflect upon himself and say, am I really qualified? Sure. And so uh, sometimes there may be a little nudging, a little persuasion that needs to take place. Um, I'm always cautious of somebody who raises their hand and said, I'll be the elder, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I, I just think it, it, it's, um, it's something that is cautious, it's proven, and, and hopefully that they will, with very little persuasion, if they're truly qualified, mm -hmm. uh, be, be willing to serve. Yeah, you, you don't want to just extort somebody into the eldership. You know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but right. willingly. And there have been situations that I know of where a man was constrained into the eldership. You know, uh, one person might say, listen, we're both qualified. You only need two. We need you. Would you come do this? And, you know, if, if somebody is brought into the eldership that way, well, then that's no way to be brought into the eldership. You have to want it. The idea is you have to want it, but you also have to be able to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. if, if, if something happens and there's a problem, I always remember the story that I read once about George Washington, how that after the Revolutionary War, his officers wanted to make him king of America. And he said, no. He said, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to overthrow one tyrant just to give you another one. And so when, when he ran for president, you know, he, he ran with this attitude of, well, if the people want me, I'll, I'll serve. But if, if they don't, then I'm not going to because I'm not just going to impose myself on the people. And you have to appreciate that spirit. Yeah. yeah. Another question has come in. How do we encourage our elders to discipline the flock when they've been negligent in this area? That's probably a pretty typical question. Yeah, and it's probably one that's uh, fairly uh, well neglected I as agree. well. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are some elders uh, or elderships or congregations without elders that are ready to discipline or, or withdraw fellowship of somebody um, very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, I think the, uh, the overall context, I mean, that would, could be a whole show in of itself just studying <laughs> that topic, but um, there's a lot of patience involved, a lot Absolutely. of counseling involved, a lot of pleading involved, a lot of persuasion involved, and so um, elders have to be on the forefront. They have to know the, the state of the flock, and they have to um, uh, be proactive right. in addressing the spiritual needs. But if the circumstances require, those things do need to take place. Yeah, you know, I, th I think that if you look at the biblical commands to withdraw fellowship, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's done hastily. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes I, I, I have known of congregations that in an effort to what I would call clean up their books, mm -hmm. they, they send out a mass mailing and withdraw from people. Yeah. That, and, yeah. and, and, you know, so it's almost like there are two extremes. On the and one that, extreme, that's not the process. Yeah, it's and, and like know. and as Jared said a minute ago, you know, there's a lot of patience and yeah, you know, it took somebody some time to get mm -hmm. out to where they are, and it's going to take some time to get them back, mm -hmm. and and you know, it's a it's a reconversion process, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Another question: Do you think a preacher should be an elder? 
<laughs> well, I know that uh, when we were nominating elders at Madisonville, there were several people that asked me if I would consider it, and I've always said no. I, 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 would, I got enough to do just being a preacher. Yeah. I don't really know that I need to add that to my workload, and I'm so happy that it worked out the way it did, where we have three godly men who are qualified, and I get to just go on being the preacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that I don't work very closely with the elders. And I'm in just about every elders meeting, and uh, I'm offering advice, making suggestions, and, uh, you know, I, it's something that I feel is, is just working so well because we've got these guys that, that I've known for 20 years and that I can work with, and, and I just feel like I know it's it, a preacher can be yeah. an elder, but I know that in my case, uh, that's not something I would desire. <laughs> well, I, you, know, you know, just uh, I think personally, and, and I've thought the very same thing, and that is, you know, I have more than I can say grace over as a preacher. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, 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 I don't see how, I, you know, I, I don't see how a preacher could do both well. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done. There are some exceptions to every, but, but and, and we have precedents for that. Peter was an elder. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a preacher and apostle. But, you know, I just think, boy, it is such a demanding oh, yeah. position. Yeah. And, and, you know, now, if somebody, some brethren see it as a conflict of interest. Some people think a preacher can't be an elder because that constitutes a conflict of interest because the elders are responsible for hiring and firing the preacher, which I don't buy that as an argument, but that is how some people honestly feel about it. Sure. Yeah. One other question, very quickly. If the wife of one of the elders passes away, would he have to step down from the eldership? Well, um, we have very limited time left to talk about this, and it's a very controversial um, qualification. It shouldn't be because the language is fairly plain. But let's just say this, there, uh, a an elder can become disqualified. Um, these um, uh, qualifications are in the active voice. The verb is they must be these things. So a person who is not so or is sober at one point can become uh, unsober and so forth. Um, the, the language here is very specific both here and in Titus. The, the uh, translators have tried to give us a clue about it. He, she, he is to be the husband of one wife. The wife there is in the genitive case. It's the genitive of possession. If she dies, she no longer possesses him. I and, think about Romans 7. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of the husband. That's so. right. But it's, it's very clear in the, in the language that uh, and I think there's a, a reason for this. It's not just that he was able to walk down the aisle, but she serves a vital role. She's just not a stamp on his fidelity, That's right. his mm -hmm. sexual fidelity, but that she, she serves right beside him. And uh, all the way back in the garden, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah, great, great I, points. I wouldn't want to face being a preacher without my wife. Uh, <laughs> listen, guys, I can't, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you've said tonight. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about and appreciate you very, very much. Uh, thank you for being a part of our program tonight. We did get a lot of comments and we appreciate that. Hope to see you back here in two weeks. Thank you again and God bless. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.